Hello, I'm Melinda Hartwig. I'm curator of ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern art at the Michael C. Carlos Museum. I'm going to take you on a tour today of objects that you would ordinarily pass by, but have interesting stories to tell. The first one that I'm going to show you is this tomb relief. The private tombs of the later Old Kingdom were decorated with scenes of daily life in the hopes that these activities would be perpetuated in the next world. Within a standard set of motifs, artists were allowed freedom to interject personal and even humorous detail. Now, this relief depicts a young boy, most likely a dwarf based on his body proportions, and he's holding a rope attached to a collar worn by a Saluki hound. What's interesting about this is that this scene was once part of a larger tableau of the tomb owner sitting in a carrying chair being carried by a number of his servants. And in fact, if you look closely, you can see a foot in back of the boy and you can see a leg in front of the Saluki hound. But that isn't the only thing that's interesting about this. You can see three hieroglyphs that are below the carrying pole and above the dog. They spell out the word HBN or heaven. This was the ancient Egyptian word for ebony. It was a dark African wood, in fact, a black wood that was very prized in ancient Egypt. The fact that his name is Blackie is certainly not missed on any of us. And in fact, that's a name that we still continue to give to our dogs today. The next relief that we're going to look at is this, belonging to Ni Ka Tet. He carried titles which showed that he was a scribe of musicians, but he was also the protector of doctors in the palace. Now, these titles are very interesting because they tell us about the importance of magicians and magic in ancient Egypt. This gentleman here, Ni Ka Tet, would have been very good at writing down spells and incantations, and he could also speak them to protect the doctors that were working on a particular patient. You can see that Ni Ka Tet is dressed in a kilt with a broad apron front. He's holding a handkerchief in one hand and a staff of office in the other. He has a beaded broad collar around his neck and wears a short beard and layered wig that is typical of the period. Now, the interesting thing about this relief, in addition to his titles, is where it was placed. And because it's sunk relief, it was placed on the outside of the building. The Egyptians used sunk relief because the sun would pick out the outlines and would not wash away the relief if it happened to be raised. In 1930, there is a picture that was taken of a partner relief to this. We don't know where it is right now, but together they formed two sides of the entrance to the tomb. People who would walk by could look at this and see who the tomb belonged to. They, it was, they were like a billboard, so to speak. We're still looking for that other relief, and hopefully it will turn up. In most art museums, you might just walk past this object. It doesn't look particularly beautiful, but I'm going to tell you why it is so incredibly important and incredibly rare. This is a stela for a woman named Nebetitet, and it has a letter to the dead. If you look at the front of the stela, you can see a woman facing right. She's dressed in a sheath dress, reaching just below her knee. Her head and hair are not preserved. If you take a look at the drawing, one hand holds a lotus flower to her nose. The other holds an ankh, which seems to be suspended in some way from her fist. You'll also notice that her proportions are extremely skewed. This is the first intermediate period, period of decentralization in Egypt, where there was a breakdown in royal workshops. And local artists had to pick up the burden of decorating tombstones, which essentially is what this is. 
Now, in front, you can see that there are three inscriptions. These are all offering formulas. One is to Anubis, who is upon his mountain. Another is to Osiris, that's on the right. And then Anubis, Lord of Sipa, which is left, and it's written backwards. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The back of the stela contains a letter to the stela's owner by Merit Tifi. And it's written in Heratic, which is the cursive form of hieroglyphs. And let me read it to you. It's quite fascinating. How are you? Is the West treating you just as you desire? Look, I am your beloved on earth, so fight on my behalf. Intercede on behalf of my name. I have not garbled a recitation before you when perpetuating your name on earth. And then become manifest as an ock for me, my face, so that I may see you fighting on my behalf in a dream. I will present offerings to you when the sun has risen, and I will furnish the offering stone for you. Now there's another message on the back that reads like this. This is from a man named Cow to the Steela's owner. I have not garbled a recitation before you, nor have I detracted offerings from you. Rather, I have procured fight on my behalf, fight on behalf of my wife and children. Now I realize this is archaic speech, which is to be expected because we're looking at a civilization that is 5,000 years ago. But there are some important points here I just want to point out. When they talk about perpetuating your name on earth, the name to the ancient Egyptians was an aspect of a person's identity. If you spoke the person's name, you caused that person to live eternally. Also, he mentioned something called an ak. An ak is the blessed dead. It means that you've passed through judgment and have made it into the illusion fields, so to speak, on the other side with the dead. It also talks about this person, the steel owner, appearing to Meratifi in a dream. And that's very common because this is how you could see the dead in this liminal or passive state of sleep. This letter to the dead, as I mentioned, was extremely rare. If you take a look at the inscription, look for the Seth animal. That is the determinative for illness. Seth was the god of chaos. So perfectly appropriate to determine a word for illness. And the phrasing in this letter to the dead is very similar to a coffin text spell, which makes perfect sense because the front of the stela is done probably by an artist who was doing coffins, on which you would have the coffin texts, obviously, and also stela. The phrase requests protection against misfortune and bad health because the ancient Egyptians believed what they could not see the dead could. And it was reciprocal. So if you left offerings for the dead, you'd be compensated. Now this stela was placed inside a tomb or a courtyard of a tomb. And now here, I need to digress a little bit. One of the great Egyptologists, Edward Wente, saw this stela while he was visiting the Cairo Museum in 1958, before it was to be shipped to the person who purchased it. He quickly copied and published the text. Then, fast forward 2008, the stela, now in the United States, another scholar named Ed Meltzer saw the stela and offered some improvements on the text. It was acquired by our museum in 2014, and recently, Dr. Rune Yorda, assistant professor of ancient Egyptian art at Emory University, took another look at this text for an article that will appear in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. He concluded a very important point. Ed Wente thought that the person who wrote the letter was male, but in fact, Merit Tifi 
is a female name and was most likely the daughter and not the husband of the tomb owner. So it was believed before that this was a letter between spouses on the opposite sides of the grave. In fact, it is between two women, which is extraordinary. It tells us in ancient Egypt that gender of the dead didn't matter, just their effectiveness in dealing with the trouble. This also changes the usual idea that only men performed the ritual of perpetuating the dead's name. In fact, this shows that women could perform the ritual as well. The stela has also been refined in date. It seems very similar to others from Dynasty 10 and 11 during the first intermediate period. And as I mentioned earlier, the painter, who most likely was from Naga Adair, did both the coffins and the stela. So we've taken a look at two reliefs and a painted stela. I think it's time now to take a look at sculpture. And in fact, in ancient Egypt, stone sculpture was king. I'd like you to turn your attention to probably a small head that you wouldn't notice. And it's right there. It may be small, but it is of a mighty pharaoh. This is a pharaoh called Amenemet III, and he ruled in the Middle Kingdom. In fact, it was his reign, which was 46 years, that Egypt reached the height of its golden age. His sculpture reflects that. He had so many sculptures done because of how long his reign was that it's virtually impossible to assign a date to this small head. But we do know that it belongs to Amenemet III for two reasons. If you look really closely, you can see his jutting jaw. He had an underbite, and that's reflected in his portraiture. He is also found with a treasure trove of copper statuary that belonged to Amenemet III at Hawara in the early 20th century. Another thing that you can tell that makes this Amenemet III is also the large ears, which are characteristic of portraiture of his reign. He wears a nemes headcloth and a royal uraeus on his brow. Lightly modeled brows rest above the ruler's sunken eye sockets, and his eyes are oval and crowned by heavy lids. The edges of the king's wide mouth curl up into a slight smile. Now, I mentioned that Amenemet III's reign was the high point of the Middle Kingdom, and in fact, probably the high point of Egypt in general. This king's representations are considered by many Egyptologists to be the best of ancient Egyptian sculpture. It's situated between the severe realism of sculpture in the Old Kingdom and the opulent, manneristic sculpture of the New Kingdom. In fact, so highly valued by the ancient Egyptians was this style because it was constantly copied by later pharaohs. Next on our gallery tour, we're going to be taking a look at this unprepossessing block of stone. This is sunk relief again, but it belongs to one of the most interesting kings of Egypt. This is Akhenaten. Akhenaten is the so-called heretic king who did away with Egypt's polytheism or worship of many gods and asked his populace to worship only one, the god Aten or the sun disk. This relief depicts Akhenaten, just his head and shoulders, He's offering a falcon-headed burner filled with incense to the Aten sun disk. The Aten's rays stream down on the king, and one holds an ankh, or the sign of life, to the king's nose. The king appears in his full regalia, wearing the blue crown, with ribbons fluttering behind it. And if you look at his profile and his representation, it is quite unusual. He has a pendulous chin, thick lips, slanted eyes, spindly neck. This style of his portraiture doesn't necessarily reflect what Akhenaten looked like. Instead, it was used to show him 
as the true son and only son of the god Aten, to put forward his specialness. This particular relief is also incredibly important because it mentions a shrine at Amarna that was once thought to be non-existent. It is one of a few blocks that refer to this structure, which is called Strong of the Living Aten. Now it has been identified in South Amarna. This was once part of a larger composition that showed Akhenaten and his wife, Nefertiti, the beautiful one has come, which is what her name means, incensing an offering to the Aten disc. There's another important point about what we call Amarna compositions. Amarna is where Akhenaten moved his capital. The sun disc, as you can see, is relegated to obscurity outside of the composition putting the focus on Akhenaten as the sole prophet and unique son of the Aten. Most people look at Akhenaten as a religious zealot, but in fact, he was a very wise and ambitious ruler. By getting rid of gods that people had worshipped for years and focusing on only one god, he also did away with their priesthoods, which had become extremely powerful. That meant the wealth of the land was now contained in his hands, as well as the worship, because people only could worship the Aten through Akhenaten himself. Our last piece for this tour is another relief. This is a relief belonging to a man named Mentu Amhat. Mentu Amhat was an official that served under the Nubians in the 25th dynasty. Now, Nubia was to the south of Egypt, and during the 25th dynasty, they conquered all of Egypt. Mentu Emhat served them in the town of Thebes, which is in the southern part of Egypt. And he was a very important official, certainly by the size of his tomb. It had a massive mud brick pylon and a substructure that was clad in limestone and decorated with beautiful low relief carving. This depiction of Mentu Emhat He's wearing a wig and a broad collar, and the style is evocative of the Old Kingdom. And this is something the Nubians were very well known for, appropriating earlier styles to legitimize their rule in Egypt. 